Nearly 40 years after his death, Yul Brynner remains beloved for his role as King Mongkut in the iconic musical The King and I. You are a very difficult woman. Perhaps so, Your Majesty. Though known to the crew as temperamental, audiences' views shifted thanks to revelations from his daughter about his private life. Join us as we explore Brynner's famous roles, personal life, bisexuality, and discreet relationships. Early Life Mysteries Over his storied career, Yul Brynner consciously cultivated an intriguing air of mystery surrounding his origins and early life, often spinning imaginative tales that contradicted the actual reality. In interviews, he provided remarkably conflicting accounts, claiming varied exotic birthplaces like Mongolia, China, Switzerland or Japan, and positing different familial backgrounds ranging from Russian aristocracy to gypsies to circus performers. When confronted about inconsistencies, Brynner once declared imperiously that ordinary mortals need but one birthday. This epitomized his calculated efforts to embellish his roots with captivating myths designed to tantalize fans in the media, whom he occasionally regarded as naively gullible. However, over the years, more facts have emerged to reveal that Yul Brynner was indeed born Yuli Borisovich Briner on July 11, 1920, in the Russian port city of Vladivostok, located on the Sea of Japan. His father, Boris, was of Swiss-German descent working as a mining engineer, while his mother, Marussia, came from an educated Russian artistic family and worked as an actress and singer. So contrary to Brynner's self-created legends of having Mongolian, Japanese, or Gypsy lineage, his actual family belonged firmly within Russia's Western-influenced intelligentsia, with some Swiss-German ancestry, via his paternal grandfather. In fact, Brynner's Swiss grandfather, Julius Briner, was one of the early foreign businessmen who helped transform Vladivostok from merely a remote czarist naval base into an attractive, thriving, and modern commercial port city in the late 19th century. Julius arrived there in 1873 to oversee new shipping operations after relocating his firm from Yokohama, Japan across the Sea of Japan. He worked alongside other European investors importing Western architects to construct pleasant stone buildings, parks, and ports befitting a prosperous international city. Today, in honor of the Briner family's historical contributions, an imposing bronze statue of Yul Brynner stands near the harbor front home where Yul was born. So, while Vladivostok represented the Russian frontier located over 4,500 miles from bustling Europeanized capitals like St. Petersburg and Moscow, its Brynner family roots tied back directly to old-world Swiss business interests. After Yule's father, Boris, abandoned the family in the tumultuous aftermath of the Russian Revolution when the lad was only seven years old, his mother, Marusha, undertook a remarkable journey relocating young Yule and his sister Vera over 500 miles northwest to Harbin, Manchuria. By 15, however, further instability caused Marussia, ever the intrepid matriarch protecting her family, to uproot her children once more, now relocating from Pacific Russia ultimately to the glittering arts mecca of 1920s Paris, France. There, resilient Marussia managed to enroll Yule in the Lycée Moncel, one of Paris's most prestigious schools, then educating children of the societal elite and European expatriate community. So while the fanciful Yule Brynner later spun imaginative new backstories of being trained by Buddhist monks or schooled in Grand Mongolian palaces to add intrigue, the reality of his early life proved one marked by much turbulent upheaval amidst the collapsed Russian frontier. Cultural change through exposure to Russian Chinese and French communities, and colorful Eastern family heritage before even reaching adulthood. Early Stage and Film Ventures After leaving school early at only 16, the multilingual Yule Brynner remained in pulsing Paris to pursue performance opportunities, first finding engagement as a Russian guitarist in the city's émigré nightclubs. The talented youth then received formal theatrical mentorship at Paris Le Théâtre Maturin, immersing himself more comprehensively in the craft of acting. During this critical immersive stage experience soaked in Parisian theatrical tradition, 
Brenner fortuitously met luminaries like avant-garde filmmaker Jean Cocteau and the infamous Cubist pioneer Pablo Picasso, interactions leaving an impression that almost certainly further sparked his creative instincts. Rumors also swirled of an intimate personal affair between Brenner and Cocteau, occasionally fueling speculation throughout the actor's life about the full extent of his sexuality. He also posed for full frontal portraits for the renowned photographer George Platt Lines, who produced photographs featuring many gay artists and writers. But Brenner remained notoriously discreet about same-sex relationships. He guarded his personal life fiercely amid his later global fame. Still, during these early insecure Parisian nights as a Russian émigré guitarist turned apprentice actor, he displayed uncharacteristic vulnerability that bonded him with others from displaced Eurasian artistic circles. When the prospects for continuity as a stage trainee stalled as war clouds gathered over Europe by 1939, the enterprising 19-year-old Brinner followed his mother Marussia in immigrating to America to pursue new possibilities. Once again displaying remarkable resilience, severing ties to a familiar life in newly adopted France, Marussia skillfully installed her son in New York City, where he found an opportunity to study acting intensely under his influential Russian theater compatriot, Michael Chekhov. As Chekhov's acting troupe toured the Americas from New York to the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles, Brinner further honed his dramatic skills across 1941 to 42, performing Shakespearean roles like Petruchio in The Taming of the Shrew that enhanced his talents. This early combination of Chekhov's vital coaching and chances to undertake substantial theatrical parts across the United States ultimately paved Brenner's path back to high visibility with early Broadway exposures like a 1942 production of Twelfth Night, followed by an important co-starring opportunity opposite Mary Martin in Lutesong in 1946. While still unable to catapult the struggling young actor to major stardom in those years, these initial Broadway roles marked important stepping stones after his arduous global upbringing. And when subsequent satisfactory acting jobs failed to flow forth easily, the perennially industrious Brinner displayed yet another side to his talents, smoothly transitioning into burgeoning television production work, including directing early TV programs while learning the Desilu studio system. By 1949, Brenner gained a steady position working at CBS alongside other future Hollywood player directors like Sidney Lumet and John Frankenheimer, embodying the king and stardom. After struggling to ascend for nearly 15 years in modest theater, early television, and grinding self-cultivation efforts, Yul Brenner's professional trajectory remarkably changed course at age 30 when he dared to audition in 1950 for the iconic central role of the proud King Monkut in Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein's new stage musical, The King and I. While the initial production was structured to showcase Gertrude Lawrence's English governess character Anna teaching the king's children more than examining the ruler himself, Brenner responded to something complex he sensed in the monarch's journey to accept new ideas after years of stubborn resistance eventually. Brenner set himself apart from other candidates through extreme diligence and commitment to mastering the nuances of this supporting role. He immersed himself in studying Thai history and Buddhist teachings, and even learning to play this unfamiliar king's instruments, like the mandolin capable of quick staccato phrasings echoing Mongkut's own darting machinations. After securing the role with this uncommon devotion, Opening night reviews, however, acknowledged Brenner's riveting stage presence, but assessed the overall show ambivalently. Some early spectators, perceiving a production still centering on Lawrence's now secondary Anna role, expressed dissatisfaction with her uneasy pairing against the relatively unknown Brenner. In one early performance, a disgruntled man even famously hurled his shoe at Brenner mid-scene, striking him squarely, shouting, Go back to China! Recalling the bizarre incident decades later with characteristic humor, Brenner remarked dryly, It was a perfectly usable shoe. The man must have really hated me. Yet, undeterred by mixed initial reactions, Brenner set about working tirelessly to strengthen audience connection to his King Mongkut with ruthless precision. He fused cocky arrogance with simmering doubts, bringing tantalizing new psychological tension to this petty tyrant. 
Brynner's mesmerizing stage presence and evocative manner soon had Broadway crowds flocking exclusively to see him shine in this otherwise flat vehicle. Then, in a moment that entered theatrical legend, Brynner made the pivotal decision to shave his head completely bald to conform with historical accuracy for a 19th-century Siamese king, rather than wear the conventional hoary wig of previous productions. This striking aesthetic move instantly amplified the brute intensity crackling behind his king's piercing eyes tenfold. That creative gamble proved the masterstroke that rocketed him to unequivocal stardom. Fate lent a hand, too, in cementing Brynner as the King and I's rightful towering centerpiece after that initial wobbly embrace. In 1952, while the production gained self-sustaining acclaim driven by Brynner's by now definitive portrayal, lead actress Gertrude Lawrence shockingly collapsed suddenly backstage one Saturday afternoon during a matinee performance and then died tragically from liver cancer complications within only five months. While Brynner issued proper statements mourning Lawrence's premature loss, show producer Leland Hayward's daughter, Brooke, astutely noted the practical shift in her memoir, Haywire, writing, Gertrude Lawrence died during the run, and suddenly Yul Brynner was the star. Indeed, Lawrence's terrible absence eradicated any earlier ongoing debate of the show belonging more rightly to its former first lady, fully ensuring Brynner ruled over this kingdom henceforth alone. Fate's sad hand spotlighted his undisputable talent and cleared lingering obstacles to his rightful coronation as King of Broadway. Brynner deservedly won a 1952 Best Featured Actor Tony Award for his by then utterly indelible turn as the bald, quixotic ruler. In the 1956 film adaptation alongside Deborah Kerr, as Anna introduced his firebrand presence to global audiences, many dazzled by this shockingly bareheaded creature representing utter exoticism on screen and bewitching magnetism off it. Kerr herself affectionately described her first sighting of her new, infamously follically challenged co-star, stating memorably, Yule of the shocking new bald head and turn-up nose took my breath away. Beyond Siam, versatile, exotic. While no subsequent role matched the stellar career heights Yul Brynner achieved playing King Mongkut, he nonetheless demonstrated impressive range in follow-up exotic parts throughout the late 1950s and 60s, which cemented his ongoing niche as Hollywood's most flexible foreign antagonist. Having newly catapulted to worldwide fame still thanks to the King and I's mammoth success, in 1956, Brynner seized an opportunity to join Cecil B. DeMille's towering epic retelling of the Ten Commandments, starring as the pharaoh Ramesses opposite Charlton Heston's Moses. In preparatory makeup tests, however, it became evident that Brynner's smooth signature bald head coupled with a far slighter 5'7 frame projected noticeably less innate commanding dominance than Chuck Heston's towering 6'3 Moses exuding biblical authority. Obsessively determined not to suffer any physical dominance from Heston under hot studio cleagues, Brynner initiated an intense bodybuilding regimen in shooting breaks, striving to sculpt some visible musculature onto his lean Ramesses frame. Between takes, he was always exercising with weights to bulk up his chest and arms, to achieve parity with Heston's imposing physique. While any onset edginess between the two leads was likely exaggerated within Hollywood trade gossip circles, credible accounts emerged of Brynner performing non-stop push-ups chin-ups, and dumbbell reps to forge himself into a more plausible adversary against Moses' holy brawn. In the finished film, glimpses of Brynner's sinewy physique and chiseled facial expressions indeed effectively projected the formidable antagonism necessary to stand against Heston's juggernaut presence. In the wake of these twin Technicolor Titan performances, Brynner quickly discovered that Hollywood relished slotting the mystery man with an ambiguous, malleable accent into pretty much any portrayal vaguely requiring non-Caucasian, Eurasian, or Latin ethnicity. While some roles unavoidably edged into uncomfortable racial stereotypes offensive by modern standards, Brynner brought an innate thoughtfulness that sought to imbue his characters with dignity and shadings beyond simplistic caricatures. With precise yet adaptable accents and chameleonic comfort slipping into robes, kimonos, Russian war uniforms, cowboy gear, or tunics for his over 70 diverse screen roles, 
Brynner gamely proved able to inhabit seemingly almost any culture required for 30 years. By this ongoing, versatile calculus, while undeniably still a Russian-Swiss stalwart, his acting stealth made Brynner into Hollywood's global everyman. Indeed, this versatility coupled with at times still mysterious persona despite fame brought Yul Brynner the colorful nickname, Hollywood's ambassador from everywhere. Brynner himself jokingly once remarked on his diverse on-screen range, I just play me in different costumes and accents. Ultimately, international audiences truly loved the crushed velvet tones of his voice. Imperious gaze peering out from below his sleek bare scalp and talent convincingly assuming almost any foreign role under prodigious layers of theatrical panache. For that generation, it hardly mattered whether a Russian portrayed Spaniards, Greeks, Arab sheikhs, Cheyenne warriors, Vietnamese officers, Argentine gunslingers, or Chinese kings. What dazzled fans was that Brynner made them all pulse vibrantly through his singular spark. Westerns and mano a mano with McQueen. In 1960, at the peak of his exotic fame playing mysterious foreigners, Yul Brynner made an unexpected pivot into the American Western genre, co-starring in The Magnificent Seven, opposite then-rising heartthrob star Steve McQueen. Set in Mexico, Brynner played mysterious black-clad gunman Chris Adams, leading six American outlaw mercenaries defending a helpless village from marauding bandits. McQueen was cast as Vin Tanner, one of Adams's crew with a flashy persona whose streetwise law-breaking ways made him an uneasy ally. Off-screen, however, accounts emerged of an even more uneasy rivalry brewing between the leads themselves as production unfolded. Despite their dangerous on-screen rapport, Brynner reportedly distrusted the younger star's attempts to grab attention, sensing a threat to his dominance as the nominal headliner. These insecurities stemmed partly from physicality, as Steve McQueen stood three inches taller than the five-foot-seven Brynner, who was perennially self-conscious about his height since childhood. Obsessed with not allowing McQueen's natural stature to figuratively or overshadow him on film frames, Brynner is said to have conspicuously constructed small hidden mounds of dirt beneath his own feet during scenes they shared. This allowed him to stand visibly elevated inches above McQueen unfairly, yet fulfilled Brynner's fixation that his position must never appear inferior next to his rising challenger. Aware of this sneaky tactic, however, McQueen then made his own power move through passive retaliation. The cunning star would discreetly kick away Brynner's concealed dirt platforms bit by bit during each take, subtly attempting to return the landscape to natural parity. These character-driven head games reflected by their gunslinger anti-heroes defining independent streaks and mutual distrust escalated tensions between the leads off-screen. Brynner became so paranoid about McQueen stealing focus that he once infamously hired a crew assistant whose sole job was just to count how many times McQueen touched or adjusted his trademark cowboy hat during Brynner's speaking lines. For emerging 1960, Hollywood belonged increasingly to a young, virile Marlon Brando and this steely McQueen not worldly 1950s elders like Cary Grant or Brynner. So his wretched ballooning paranoia of being upstaged, while perhaps understandable on some level, also came to define Brynner's star descent into offers playing heavies rather than leads in mediocre projects thereafter. Their infamous rivalry made for scintillating Hollywood press. But in letting McQueen get so corrosively under his skin rather than coexist professionally, Brynner's bitterness and ego arguably damaged his career trajectory most with this fateful 1960 inflection point. Enigmatic reputation and unyielding demands. As Yul Brynner's star rose to its apex through iconic performances in The King and I and The Ten Commandments, his reputation for making outrageous off-screen demands befitting an imperious monarch also soared among studio staff and fellow stars. Always telegraphing hardness with a raspy voice and steely gaze, Brynner brought similar cold intimidation to negotiations seeking to maximize his every comfort and privilege no matter the imposition. While complex personal insecurities catalyzed these controlling tendencies behind the scenes, to underlings Brynner's frequent cruelty in refusing the slightest accommodation made him the most dreaded and despised personality in Hollywood, according to some crew member trails. Thus came his snide industry nicknames like The Grump, 
and King of the Tightwads, alluding to miserly expectations despite his fortunes reaped by starring in lavish blockbusters. During location shooting of the World War II drama Moratori in 1965, Brenner pulled arguably his most eccentric power play ever. The film required extensive sequences set aboard freighters out at sea, yet dreading monotonous passage across choppy gray waters after interminable days acting, Brenner demanded production build an improvised helicopter landing pad directly on the ship. This special modification allowed him personal commission of a private chopper whisking the great man ashore alone to comfort at day's end, abandoning lesser cast and crew to standard ocean voyages back. While fellow stars like Marlon Brando or Frank Sinatra owned bad boy reputations off-screen, Brinner was probably the only actor ever who needed to be flown off a mundane film shoot daily, lest he deigns to suffer common passage. Through the decades, whenever studios or theater owners acquiesced to his mercurial preferences, equally extraordinary new demands seemed to follow continually. Brinner's splendidly furnished customized personal dressing room and indulgent perquisites became as legendary as his performances. Biographer Michelangelo Capua recounted some of Brinner's exorbitant everyday expectations, including cartons of the same brand of mineral water, special furniture, additional phone lines, mirrors, egg rolls, and air conditioners. Everything was precisely tailored to his estimations of self-comfort, betraying no concessions to cost or burden. Whenever circumstances fell short of this anticipated splendor, Brinner thought nothing of browbeating organizers Clint Eastwood style or storming off in a rage inconveniencing all involved. A frightening case occurred during a guest interview on NBC's Today Show, when arriving to find staged seats of unequal height, Brinner disgustedly abandoned host Barbara Walters' mid-show, rather than suffer the minor mark of diminished stature beside fellow guests on live TV. Such selfish acts bordering on narcissistic disorder won him contempt among peers for massive inner frailties contradicting that outer brute facade. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. The world knew him as the iconic shaved head actor in The King and I, but few were aware of Yul Brynner's secret daughter with model and actress Frances Martin, hidden from the spotlight. Yul Brynner's daughter confirms what we thought all along, Lark Brenner reveals the ups and downs of being the daughter of a Hollywood megastar, born outside the bounds of marriage. Yule did not acknowledge Lark as his child until she was 17. Despite a roller coaster relationship, she now cherishes her father's memory. Proud of his stellar acting career and his courageous anti smoking advocacy before lung cancer took his life in 1985. Lark also traveled to Russia to unveil her late father's statue in his hometown of Vladivostok. What do you most remember Yul Brynner for? Let us know your favorite Yul Brynner performance in the comments. The questing intellect. Beyond fame playing exotic strongmen, Yul Brynner privately cultivated wide-ranging intellectual passions that shaped deeper dimensions of his personhood. A polyglot since youth, Brynner attained fluency in English, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Russian, Cantonese, Japanese, and some Romany, which imbued a unique perspective both into acting and engagements like his humanitarian work for United Nations refugee programs. During midlife, Brynner also nurtured a strong affinity for history and moral philosophy under the influential guidance of scholar Dr. Paul Schilp, the famed professor who founded the Library of Living Philosophers archive of in-depth interviews engaging renowned thinkers. Although never attending university formally, Brinner audited university-level ethics courses taught by Schilp aimed at leading decision-makers. He brought such energetic commitment to these studies that Schilp glowingly praised Brinner's intellect, stating, He had one of the most brilliant minds I ever encountered. This fierce curiosity only deepened with age as Brynner devoured dense tomes ranging from ancient Eastern poets to Russian classics Tolstoy and Dostoevsky during his extensive travels. Biographer Capua noted Brynner was a great reader and owned an immense library, frequently gifted rare volumes by contacts around the world aware of his eclectic tastes. Some who dismissed the bald, exotic performer as merely a pretty Hollywood face or cliched villain were astonished to discover Brynner's hearty appetite for tackling writings on politics, economics, fine art and opera, or assembling an art photography collection exceeding 8,000 personally shot images 
including luminaries Marlene Dietrich, Mia Farrow, and Leonard Bernstein. Brinner also relished chess with celebrity friends and playoff matches backstage on opening nights, often fueled as much by competitive predilection as theatrical nerves. This underpublicized intellectual dimension helps account for late career intrigue that drew Brinner to pioneering science fiction concepts. He discerned rippling through author Michael Crichton's early Western thriller screenplay Westworld from 1972. Set in a futuristic fantasy amusement park, where wealthy visitors interacted hedonistically with humanoid androids programmed to satisfy every frontier-era adventurous whim and desire, the script's core idea of technology enabling boundless, dark, unconscious human appetites fascinated Brinner as he obsessively prepared to play the malfunctioning robot gunslinger who suddenly targets clients sadistically. Private Life Despite later being typecast on screen as untethered rogues living among foreign communities, off-screen Yule Brinner nurtured surprisingly traditional domestic yearnings as a family man throughout his life. He married four times spanning nearly four and fathered five children who today remember tender private moments beyond the austerity rejecting unnecessary emotional expenditures. Brinner's first marriage to actress Virginia Gilmore from 1944 to 1960 yielded son Rock Brinner in 1946, who matured into a historian and writer teaching in Connecticut. Tragically, Rock passed away recently in October 2023. In 1962, during Brinner's second marriage to Chilean model Doris Kleiner, he fathered daughter Victoria, a consultant living in Los Angeles. Yule Brinner's daughter confirms what we thought all along. With his third wife, Jacqueline Thion de la Chaume from 1971 to 1981, Brinner adopted young Vietnamese war orphans Mia and Melody. Despite frequent career separations and controversies, her daughter regarded Yule as a great and loving father. His final 1983 marriage to Malaysian ballerina Kathy Lee lasted contentedly until his death in 1985. By several children's accounts, despite the broken succession of mothers, Brinner nurtured lasting profound connections with each even through transitions. Yet this battened-down domestic satisfaction only emerged privately after closing the stage door. Publicly, Brinner pruned a contradictory, miserly image forbidding frivolous excess. Despite reputed peak career earnings of over $157 million in today's money, he had a comical, penny-pinching reputation on movie sets and publicity tours, where privilege trappings needed a strict managerial eye. Brenner traveled with his own food provisions and tools, even for banquet dinners to control portions, famously once chastising a chef in France for wasteful vegetable trimmings. Some friends speculated this curious stinginess was overcompensation for early poverty in exile, instilling a lasting dread of instability. But as with all Brenner matters, definitive motives remain elusive. Perhaps Mel Brooks parodied his friend's dual public-private Brinner personae most insightfully saying behind the on-screen, camels, pyramids, extravaganzas, lurked essentially plain chicken off-screen. Ever final contradictions between self-perceptions and realities too human. Curtain calls as the king. Despite frustrations with film roles diminishing in the 1960s as public taste moved on from Hollywood exotic epics, Yul Brynner continually returned to the stage domains where he first achieved stardom. Throughout later years to his final curtain, The King and I's King Mungkut represented Brynner's signature calling card filling concert halls and touring companies enabling both comforts and glory in old age. After the first run, Brynner revived his bald majesty first during a 1977 Broadway revival. Then, for much of his late 50s and 60s until shortly before dying at 65, Hardly a year passed without Brinner starring in some lavish production of the Rodgers and Hammerstein classic for nostalgic crowds. By 1985, when lung cancer forced final bows, his lifetime tally of King shows reached a Guinness record of 4,625, which was never replicated nor fathomable today. Embracing Spirituality and Making Peace after receiving a devastating terminal throat cancer diagnosis resulting from lifetime heavy smoking in 1983, Yul Brynner remarkably embraced sobering reality with minimal self-pity. Somehow this apex predator so wary of perceived vulnerabilities earlier in life summoned late grace facing the harshest truth. 
Finally, with time short yet so much still meaningful, deeper dormant dimensions awoke shifting focus toward family and spirituality. Already fascinated for years by Eastern thought, art, and Buddhism, Brinner began studying conclusively to penetrate mystical concepts more meaningfully while coming to terms with pain and finite timelines. And the discipline that first lured him to seek theatrical authenticity playing Asian rulers, he now channeled profoundly facing that last stand. Former Buddhist monk Quentin Belding, who grew close to counseling the actor, noted new joy observing Brinner's late renewal, marveling, Yule approached death beautifully like a samurai, content finally simply sinking into fate with fearlessness few achieve. During exhausting rounds of radiation stemming cancer's advance, which eventually proved futile, Brinner also recorded teachings on suffering and impermanence from 13th century Zen master Dogen. Belding recalled even hearing the stoic Russian's Slavic tones invoke key mantras and principles learned as death encroached. While old acting intimates frequented his deathbed, Belding interestingly sensed their earthly bonds formed little solace. Rather, Brinner drew comfort solely from across spiritual bridges, as if after a lifetime commanding all environments, only now submitting trusting the unknown. Given Brinner's lust larger than life, this surrender in the end moved witnesses enormously. That shift represented triumphing at long last over pride fixations, finally glimpsing these consumed far less meaning than believed. Ultimately, having played omnipotent Ramesses and all-powerful Oz among other imposing alpha roles, besting even cancer proved meaningless next to humility making the last peace. For this reborn dying monarch, at least, holy grails shone brightest in letting all status symbols go. Grappling with Mortality By October 1985, after battling lung cancer for two draining years with radiation and chemotherapy attempting to eradicate malignant throat tumors, it became clear treatments could only stall terminally aggressive disease rather than hope to reverse Yule Brynner's fate. Yet ever the Hollywood showman even facing curtain calls, Brynner engineered arrangements for one startling final act cheating darkness a posthumous anti-smoking public service message he recorded intended to play after his imminent passing. Though society still casually condoned ubiquitous public smoking in that mid-1980s era, Brinner aimed to use his own grim outcome to offer an overdue wake-up call condemning cigarette risks. Having begun smoking as a 12-year-old, Brinner rude by 1983 inflicting this entirely preventable sentence losing half his life from an addictive force embraced ignorantly. In his iconic 20-second commercial, Brinner's personal resolve still burns fiercely eyeing the lens, stating simply, Now that I'm gone, I tell you, don't smoke. Whatever you do, just don't smoke. That haunting baritone speaking literally from the grave resonated deeply by conveying urgency against profound losses. Remarkably, within only six months, over 800,000 Americans reportedly quit permanently inspired by Brinner's admonition from beyond reaching them. For a public conditioned to dismissing smoking cancer links as a speculative personal plea from an actual admired celebrity robbed of life suddenly felt real enough to activate change. By that vulnerable act of openly admitting vincibility where his cadenced voice once seemed proof against all earthly assault, Brinner detonated overdue ethical duty, his truth splitting open lingering consensus and suspending judgment on the issue. While his storied acting career conjured many indelible moments on screen and stage over 40 years, this painfully honest off-screen finale reckoning with then still underestimated chemical and cancer consequences deserves special commendation. Because in his death, Brinner forced many to confront threats they dismissed hearing only from him finally. For once, that centurion wasn't acting. Fate made the performance real this time. And it was powerful. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.